in order to understand all of this a little bit better right this whole concept of ir filters and fir filters and the difference between them and the analysis that we try to do it helps to bring in a concept called kpn so kpn or khan process networks is a model of computation right which is used in order to represent various kinds of not just signal processing but various kinds of communicating processes okay it is even used in the context of uh, high performance computing or uh, other kinds of multi processing systems in general a subset of khan process networks is something called data flow which is has very special relevance in the context of signal processing right and understanding what are the sort of limitations of data flow is useful to understand what kind of models we can build and how we can understand signal processing algorithms so what i'm going to do is to generalize this idea from you know whatever we had for a filter and say let's look at this concept of khan process networks to put it in short it's basically a distributed model of computation where each unit of computation is modeled as a sequential process something happens inside a sequential process and these different processes are communicating with each other by means of first in first out channels okay so fifo by the way i'm assuming everybody understands what fifo means right this is basically stands for a first in first out in this case channel in general fifos are usually used in the context of buffers it's exactly the same thing it is something which allows you to say that the first value that i put into this communication channel is the first that will come out on the other side uh, the representation that is usually used for these kind of uh, computational nodes is to say that i have these circles are the processes and these are the channels so what does that mean it basically what we are saying is that a b and c in this case are first in first out channels that connect the two the two circles on the left and the one circle on the right with the process unit p right so p is a process it takes two inputs where do those inputs come from from two channels which are labeled as a and b and it does something with it we don't know or, uh, we don't know what it does or and we don't care but it produces an output on to the channel c okay so khan process networks is less concerned with what is happening inside p than how the different units a b uh, how the different units p and its neighbors are communicating okay there is something to be understood in terms of the semantics of these networks what i mean by semantics is we have drawn a certain uh, diagram corresponding to a uh, khan process network and it has the different elements over there have certain meanings right and the most important sort of terminology is there is something called a token okay and what is a token going back to this diagram a token would be anything which is present on one of the channels right so any piece of data that i want to transfer from the left hand side upper node to p goes on to the channel a right and that would constitute one token okay. now i am saying that these are atomic read and write elements what does that mean the simplest way to think about a token is that a token could be one sample so let's say that i am trying to do filtering of data then the input samples would essentially constitute one token on the other hand it need not be something as simple as that i could also say that one token is a complete image right a two dimensional three color image corresponding to one frame of a video processing system right so if i am trying to model my different computational elements where one the processing element is actually something which takes let's say an input image and what it does is maybe you know converts from rgb to yuv right one color format to another okay that entire process would be considered to have taken one token that is one image as input and generate one token that is one image as output okay the important point to keep in mind is these tokens in other words need not be necessarily small units of information they can be fairly large in themselves but 
the understanding is that a complete token at a time is read or written onto a channel okay now the next thing is that the communication between these processes happens via unbounded fifo channels right? and i'm assuming unbounded which is of course unrealistic right i mean that doesn't happen in practice but that's just done as part of the model itself to sort of understand what could potentially happen over here in practice of course we need to do need to have some kind of bounds on how many elements need to be there in the channel okay in terms of semantics once again the assumption is that writes are non blocking that is to say whenever there is data whenever i want to output data i can always put it out onto the channel okay i don't need to check whether the fifo is full or there is a buffer is full before writing anything onto it that's exactly what i mean by unbounded fifo channel and on the other hand reads are blocking what that means is if there is no data present on some input that unit will just wait over there until some data appears okay and in general the networks or rather the processing elements are not allowed to sort of test whether there is some data present on a channel before consuming it you just perform a read and you can proceed to the next step only if data actually appears on that channel okay furthermore one fifo cannot be consumed by multiple processes in other words if i have a fifo connection between a and b right so let's say that a and b are two processes and there is some fifo channel f between them right that's it i cannot also have this same thing being read by c right that's not permitted right i could on the other hand have something which looks like a over here and c over here this would be considered as two separate channels right so this is okay i don't have a problem with this and similarly we also have the thing that multiple processes cannot write to one fifo if you look in terms of the diagram the graphs that i'm uh, drawing over here you would see that you know the same thing happens right i can't have two lines sort of joining at a point except directly at a node okay and hopefully of course you know you have already made the connection that all of these things that i'm drawing over here these circles and arrows and so on correspond to the nodes and edges of some kind of a graph and from here onwards a lot of the terminology that we use will correspond to the graph theory right there are these nodes where the processing is happening there are the edges that correspond to channels okay. and finally what we have is that given a specific input set of tokens the execution of the process network is deterministic there is no sort of randomness involved in the type of computation that happens okay so a uh, little bit more of terminology if the alpha process has no inputs in the graph that i'm drawing that is it has a zero in degree so to say then it's considered a source right and can it can keep producing outputs it does not have to wait for anything on its input on the other hand if it does not have any outputs it's considered a sink right it can receive as many values as you put into it but it will never produce an output and the individual processes of course consume fixed numbers of inputs and produce outputs on each firing right so this term firing is something which is going to keep coming up in the context of understanding kpn networks in terms of practical implementation right when we are looking at it from a hardware implementation point of view the way to think of each of these processes is that there is some kind of a state machine running inside it Okay, a finite state machine. So, what does a finite state machine do? Right. Remember, if you go back to your basic digital logic, the finite state machine will have. You can think of it as having one state, either an idle state or a wait state or whatever it is. Where what it does is it keeps checking on the inputs. Is an input present? Right? Remember what I said about CAN process networks. You are not allowed to check whether an input is present and move on. In practice, of course. you have to check whether an input is present and all that we are saying is if an input is not present you have to remain in the same state you are not allowed to change your state okay 
So that's more of a higher level constraint that we are putting on the states that we have. Once there are enough inputs, it moves into a new state which is active and it can do some kind of computation. Right? Like I said, it could be as simple as multiplying two numbers together or it could be more complicated like doing a color space conversion on an image. Right? So the active state could involve multiple clock cycles, it could involve a fairly complex function that's actually getting implemented over there. And once it's done, it produces an output and returns to the wait state for more inputs. An example of, you know, in a C-like programming language, right? All that I'm saying is, let's assume that there are two channels. There is an input channel U and an output channel V, right? Now, of course, C doesn't have this concept of channels as such. But once we bring in the high-level synthesis, uh, right? I mean, th uh, this concept of a channel is useful enough that in Vivado HLS, they have brought in this context uh, this concept of something where you can actually think of something called a stream, which allows us to precisely model this type of channel. So the kind of functionality that I would like to have is this process, well, I should probably have called it P over here, right? What it does is it reads something from the channel U, okay, does some processing and writes it out onto channel V, okay? This is, and the way that this is represented is that this red dot over here is a token which is consumed by the processing element P, right? And this is produced as an output token. I could also, in the context of CAN process networks at least, have more complex mod processes being modeled, right? I could, for example, have some kind of internal state variable. Hopefully those of you who are familiar with C programming would realize that, you know, when you see something like static bool, what it means is that now this variable B, the important property that it has is every time this function A is called, right, it takes the value which it last had, right? So the first time around that I'm going to call it, it will be initialized with the value true. But the second time I call A, because of this last function over here, B will have the value false. The last step over here, B will have the value false. The third time it will once again be true. Fourth time it will be false and so on. So it will keep on alternating, right? So what is this function in other words going to do? It will first read one value from here, right? Then it will read the second value from here. The third value will come once again from the upper uh, channel, the fourth one will come from the lower channel, the fifth one will come from the upper channel, sixth from the lower channel and so on. Okay, so effectively this does some kind of multiplexing between two different streams. But at each point, because of these blocking reads, right, if there is nothing present on one channel, it will wait over there until something does come on that channel and only then move forward. Now, if you think about it, signal processing algorithms are usually not like this, right? They usually have like fixed functionality. They will basically wait for some data on both the channels, do something with both of them and put the output. Okay. On the other hand, these networks are very clear, specifically said, a process like this is saying that, yes, it can model something more complicated, where it, the functionality depends on something at runtime. 